um, by, by way of his obedience. So faith and works were both simultaneously employed, acting as a dynamic illustration of obedience to God. Next slide. Abraham was marked with God's righteousness because he believed and obeyed the Lord's instruction. His trust level for God in challenging circumstances solidified a close relationship to God. So what motivated or prompted Abraham to show great faith that righteousness, that righteousness was imputed upon him by God? Next slide. Here we find that the main ingredient is God. The act or expression of faith is birthed from the nature of faith. And as Minister Corey reads Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse nine. Here beginning the reading of God's holy word, Deuteronomy seven, verse nine. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So far the scriptures. So here we see that God is faithful. Faithfulness is not just one of God's attributes, it is his nature. It is one of the perfections of his divine character. His faithfulness outlives one generation and extends to all future generations unconditionally. The conditions of God's faithfulness is, not, is that he is faithful to himself and his covenant. He is fashioned even with, with faithfulness. As Minister Corey reads Psalm 89 verse eight, it beginneth the reading of God's holy word. O Lord God of hosts, who is strong, who is a strong Lord like unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee? So far the scriptures. Thank you, Minister Corey. Um, here we also see God's, dis God's love on display. Love and grace not only go hand in hand, but they are inseparable. Love is also one of the perfections one of another perfection of God's divine character and his glorious nature. God loves, but he is love in itself. Um, Minister Corey, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 10. Verse 7, it begins the reading of God's holy word. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So far the scriptures. Next slide. Our nature, com uh, our nature compelled us to repel him and be at enmity with him. When we say we love God, it's not out of anything that is sourced from us, but from the one who is the well of love. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse three. The Lord hath appeared of me unto, uh, hath appeared of old unto me saying, yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, have I drawn thee. So far, the scriptures. So I, I, I wanted to go into that background to, to kind of expound from James chapter 2, verse 26, because here we see, um, oh, you can stay on that slide. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, here we see, again, a marriage of faith and works. James cautions hearers to not practice, to not only practice their faith in in the Lord Jesus Christ with respect of persons. Serving the pleasure of oneself with incentives is partial and opposes seeking the good for others. Respect of persons sets a precedent to prefer an individual over another rather than seeking the good for all. In chapter two, James makes a clear distinction of what faith looks like and what works looks like. Professing faith is a declaration of believing in God while works by faith is the proof of God working in an individual to do good works. Here we see that faith and works must be married to one another in order to glorify God and sanctify the individual, proving their faith is by work in faith. 
James is in no way contradicting Paul's letter to Eph um, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, as Minister Corey reads it. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So far, the scriptures. Paul states justification comes by way of faith and not works. James affirms work by faith in verse 14 of chapter 2. Minister Cora, I'm sorry. What doth, what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? James is saying that there is a requirement of active faith a faith made alive through demonstration of faith. How should this faith impact works? There ought to be a work done in us first before we can do any good work. Ephesians chapter two, verses, verses three through six says, Minister Corey. And ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing and say unto him, sit thou here in the good place and say to the poor, stand thou there or sit here under my footstool? Are you not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? But you have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? So far the scriptures. Okay, and um, I'm not too sure if that was, um, chapter Ephesians chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. Okay, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of, the, of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved, and have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Godly fruit should produce from us good works by the power of the Holy Spirit through, G through Christ Jesus. Work ought to be sourced from the faith we profess in Jesus Christ and that he saved us from our sins. So here we, we get into detail a little bit on what, where work begins. Work um, in the strong concordance, it refers to acts, deeds, or accomplishments for a desired result by exercising mental or physical, or physical faculty. So, you know, I want to go into uh, work from a perspective of, of God. You know, God created work. Um, we see a little illustration of that in Psalm Chapter 19, verses 1 through 3. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So far, the scriptures. We see this illustrated, we also see this illustrated vividly in Genesis chapter 2. We see how God has, um, you know, when he created the heavens and the earth. Um, and his work, and in his work, he said his work was good. Everything functioned according to how he placed it. And everything also reflected his glory, reflected his holiness, reflected his righteousness, as well as his faithfulness. So we, we, we know that um, in the garden, God gave Adam the awesome responsibility of stewardship to put forth works in the, in the garden of Eden when he said, dress and keep the garden. Next slide. Um, we also see that work is, re is a reward from God. Work, once a fulfilling activity by God mandated to Adam, was, was cursed, resulting in labor being hard and earned. Uh, although this punishment happened, caused from sin, meaning disobedience to God's commandment in the garden, there's still a fulfillment and a value found in labor, in laboring. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 through 20. Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor 
that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, which is his portion. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. For he shall not remem much remember the days of his life because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. So far the scriptures. Next slide. Um, I, b before I continue on this current slide, um, we, we see how God does a work in us and the work that he does in us is it, it enables us to, to bring forth uh, uh, an illustration of what he's doing in us. So the, the work that we see him, what we've seen him do in creation, um, what we've seen him do in, in ourselves, it's in a way we see that um, the work that we do for him is not just a work where um, it's just, you know, the way we go to work at our jobs, but it's also energy. You, you put energy when you work, uh, you get tired from working, you get tired from labor. Um, so, you know, just to continue into uh, Genesis chapter two, verse 17 through 19, we'll, we'll see that we'll see where work in a, in a way was tainted. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. So far, the scriptures. Okay, uh, so through, so in verse se uh, 17 through 19, uh, again, we see how now Adam had to work. He had to sweat. He had to put forth work. He was no longer able to enjoy work the way God intended. Um, so this, you know, the, the work that we put in, you know, just uh, to, to put food on the table, we have to, you know, work on a Monday through a Friday. It's tiring, it's laboring. But that was never God's intent for work to be something that was laborious or boring, but there's supposed to be a fulfillment in that. Um, again, God never intended or desired that work be cursed or subject to grief and difficulty. But this is what sin and our disobedience to him has caused us and um, in us and in the world. Next slide. Uh, what kind of work? Uh, work is exercised through will, power, men mental faculty, and desire. There is a purpose to work, simply to glorify God, whether it be by way of talent, ability, or spiritual gifts. Sin, sin, caused, sin caused us to deviate from that design that God had a plan for us and the works we produce. It is required of us to perform works out of obedience to the instruction given in, in Scripture to perform them. Our godly works prove our obedience to God by submitting to the plan God has called forth in and by grace. Conformity to his son's image generates this newness to perform that plan. Next slide. Um, Galatians chapter five, verse 19 through 21 points us in the right direction of works. We perform that, um, we perform out to, to, uh, that opposes good works that comes from God and manifests through, um, through those justified by faith. Uh, verse 19 through 21. It beginneth the read of God's holy word. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, reveling, revelings, and such the like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So far the scriptures. Um, as I went kind of, you know, the previous slide talking about um, works and God being faithful, God being loving there, you know, what comes to my mind is the, the work that you see uh, Abel put in and the work that you see Cain put in, you know, Cain tilled the ground, Abel um, took care of the sheep. But here we see in Galatians, it talks about works, but in the sense of 
the works inwardly. You know, you, you see Abel when he, he gave his best to the Lord um, by way of giving his first fruits, but it didn't change the fact that he had to put a physical work into, into what his job was to perform, being a shepherd and watching over, watching over sheep. Cain, his, his job was to till the ground, t- you know, harvest the ground, but there's a difference between Cain and Abel. Cain had, you know, a bunch of jealousy and envy and, and anger, and he gave the last of his fruits to God. So here we see a, a, a little bit of works of internal works and, and external works. Um, we see here in Galatians chapter five, uh, verse 19 to 21, that all of these works that, that we perform, it's natural to us. It's actually, in, you know, it's, it's innate in us. This is, this is what scriptural, scriptures would call the old man. You know, this is what I would do. This is what you would do. We would, we would be jealous towards one another for what we have or what we're able to do. And in that, that doesn't glorify God. So um, we, we also see the, the contrast to the works of the flesh on, on the bottom right, where it says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Uh, next slide. These very, these very works will be tested. Um, you know, I, I, I notice at my job, you know, I, I, I have a job where I work with a bunch of people. I have a team where we work on designs and everybody has a, their, their difference of opinion. Everybody has their idea, their take, but it's not, it's not one idea that always works. It's not one person takes, um, take that, that um, overtakes, you know, the whole design. It takes multiple people to work together to, to, to basically come up with one plan. So if I come up with an idea, you know, or a work, so to speak, you know, I have this idea and I want to implement this, the other team tests that. So it, if, if I could see that in, in, at my job, you even see that in our faith, you know, our works are tested. I could do something good for you, you know, go, go to the grocery store, and um, get you groceries for you, and you might not be able to get it for yourself. But that's an external work. Anybody could do that. Anybody could get, do a good gesture, but have a ha, have an inwardness of not having, you know, a love for you, uh, a care for you. They could do the groceries, bring your groceries, and then go back home and talk behind your back. Um, they 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 could do something nice externally, but internally there's nothing good toward you or nothing good about you, nothing that's said about you. So, you know, we, we see how work could be tested by way of God's light. You know, uh, scriptures um, kind of touches on how every work under the microscope of God's light will be revealed by faith. You know, we, when we're looking at our faith and we're looking at the things that we do in this faith, in ministry, um, in our families, in our marriage, with our kids, with people in the world, just because we profess that, that we, we believe in God and we believe in scripture, what is scripture propelling us to do in that the, the works are coming from that change in us by God? You know, you, you see philanthropists, you see, um, you know, people that feed the poor, you see organizations that, that do those good works, but it doesn't mean that they're saved. It doesn't mean that that, that they're God's elect. Anybody could feed the poor. Anybody could, um, could do a good gesture for the next person. But at the same time, um, we, have to, we have to know that it's God that has to do the change in us to glorify him that when it's tested, that very thing that's tested by fi- fire remains because everything else is gonna burn away. That, that's, not, that's not wrought or done by God's work in us. Um, next slide. Um, Corinthians chapter, uh, oh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 through 15. Okay, begin at the reading of God's holy word. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, 
which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So far, the scripture. Um, if we could go back to the second slide, um, go back to the original where it talks about um, James chapter 2, verse 26. Again, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Um, again, I touched on, you know, how there, there's many people in the world that, that do good things and yet their works are gonna, be, are gonna be dead before God. It's not gonna be something they could bring before the throne to say, hey, Lord, I did this for you. Hey, Lord, I, I fed the poor. Hey, Lord, I, um, I, I made our nation great. Because again, God is not after those things. God, God is after a personal work in each and every one of us. Um, you know, we, you know, I could give you money. I could, you know, do the nicest thing in the world. But again, if I'm not doing that from a place that glorifies God, that is just as dead as a corpse before God. Um, the faith that ought to work in us to do good works is what Galatians also illustrated, um, peace, joy, and all of, all of those things that come from God ought to, to bring forth a, a way of, of glorifying God, of worshiping God, of, of actually being thankful that it is God that, that is the only one that could do good works, um, not, with, not only within us, but in this world. Um, if you could go to the last slide again. Um, I believe there's one more slide after that. Yes. Um, the, the last work of iniquity, Ma Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 um, through 23. Here beginneth the reading of God's holy word. Many will say it to me in that day. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So far, the scriptures. Uh, next slide. Um, God's judgment on all mankind's works performed under heaven and on earth will be judged. Those things, those who have performed works for their own, through their own ability or power or own, their own resources, it won't be acceptable to God on the day of judgment. We can't justify bringing our best to make, make it equal to God's good. Our works always will compete with grace. It, it always will, because uh, we all know that God's grace is an unmerited favor. To even do good is a, is a gift within itself. Um, and, uh, and ultimately that, that targets the salvation plan of God through Christ Jesus. Um, every one of our works, it, it's, it's equal to a lie. You know, it's, it's something that we, we know if I go to God and say, Hey, I did this, I did that. Why am I not able to make it into heaven? Um, because again, you didn't accept my son, Jesus Christ. You didn't let him do the work to let him work through you. And th those things that we constitute as doing good works, coming to church or, um, you know, feeding the poor, or like I said, any good work, that has to be done through the working in us to do that good work, you know, through us uh, on the external. Because I, I, could, I could feed the poor, but every person that, that, that's fed from me, you know, I give them a, a money or I buy them food, that doesn't mean that they're gonna accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But if I feed them and while I feed them, I, I give them the word, I, I feed their spirit. I let them know, hey, God is here to save you. And here's, here's, here, here's what the word says. That's a work that's equal to what pleases God. And if, if there's anything that I would bring before God that's outside of what he does in me, it is a lie. Because then I'm coming to him and I'm saying, hey, this should be my, my, my badge of merit and why I should be, I, I should be with you. 
Um, and, and God is just not going to accept that. God is not going to accept any work that is, that is done in the flesh. And uh, again, as, as James chapter two, verse 26 says, it's dead just as the body is dead without the spirit. So is faith without works. So the spirit of God is, is the one that gives me that faith to do God's will and to please him and to do that outward means that would be a blessing to others. So we don't, we can't bring an alternate plan to this work that faith could bring to glorify God. And that is the end of my presentation for tonight. Pastor Brian. All right. Uh, praise the Lord, everybody. Uh, let's give uh, Deacon Sim another hand of encouragement. Wasn't that a wonderful theology of work and works uh, versus uh, faith salvation? Praise the Lord. I think um, uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Martin, Martin Luther would have been very proud of you. <laughs> Sim, that was absolutely wonderful. That was a wonderful theology um, of faith uh, and also a demonstration of faith versus work salvation praise the lord and it you know it it I, I, as you were teaching i just couldn't help but reflect on how many churches desperately need this kind of teaching because a lot of saints um are very very much um uh enslaved to the idea that the works that they perform hold some kind of merit as far as their salvation is concerned. And that is just such a very dangerous and insidious teaching that unfortunately many of our Catholic brothers and sisters are just enslaved to. They're enslaved to that idea that in order for their salvation to have some kind of merit before God, they have to go through the ritual of um, doing the Hail Marys, um, of going to mass, of doing this and that. Um, going on Hajj, um, doing charitable works, praying three times a day. So you know what? What so? What's um, is the fact that through the sound teaching of the idea that we, of course, uh, can scriptures alone or the final court of arbitration, we can not only rest what we think about this life and every fast our works. Your, your, your works and the things that you perform, they actually testify to the faith that you have inside. The works that you perform can't save you. God. God is the one that initiates the salvation. He is the one that actually gives you the grace to do the works while you are actually on this planet. So the scripture says, let's work the work of him that sent us. And it also says that, um, that, that, that we should work out our salvation. But it also teaches us that God is the one that's working the works in us. So we, we, if we 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 save a, a, a thousand people on an evangelistic crusade, we can't even take credit for that because it's God that's doing the work in us. Um, this morning in my meditation, you know, I said to the Lord, um, you know, Lord, whatever you're doing in the earth, I want to be a part of it, and 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 I want to uh, work the work that you show me. And I prayed that prayer after the scripture. If you remember, Jesus said um, um, to his critics, he said, uh, I only see what I do the father. I only see, I only do what I see the father doing. I only do what I see the father doing. So when Jesus did something, what does that mean? It meant that Jesus actually saw the natural before he actually executed in the natural and the physical. And that's, that's how I want to live my life. And I'm encouraging all of you to also think in that particular way. But in order for us to see God work, 
in the physical where we exist, we have got to know the heart and mind of God. And how do we know the heart and mind of God? It's through sitting under the teaching of the word that we have had here on nights like tonight. It's the monotony of sitting under the word. This is where you learn it. This is where you learn how to please God. It's not in, you know, going to an anything is wrong with charitable work, evangelistic crusades, feeding the poor, you know, um, helping the elderly. Nothing is wrong with that. We ought to do those things. We're charged to do those things. But having the right perspective in terms of what those things mean to God, it not only it blesses us that what we're doing is favored by God and God is going to reward us in the end for our surrender to him as he works through us. So I just thank the Lord for the teaching tonight. I thank the Lord for the team. Everyone, this is the team's final night, <laughs> believe it or not. I don't know what happened to the calendar, Bishop. I don't know what happened. Um, we, we, we're finished for the month, everyone, because next week is, of course, uh, Christmas programming, and the following uh, Friday is, of course, Christmas Day. So we thank the Lord for the opportunity. Um, um, Minister Corey, he did a fabulous job last week, everyone, didn't he? It was so very juicy, and we just thank the Lord, and we salute him uh, also for his diligence, and we thank the Lord for Deacon Sim for his due diligence as well. And I think that, you know, that if, if we ever encounter and have a discussion with, you know, um, 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 a Catholic or, or even someone of another faith, you know, this is a PowerPoint and a teaching that we can actually give them to show them step by step how they can think in a more biblical way um, about work and about um, works salvation. So we just thank the Lord for the teaching tonight. And at this point, we want to hand it back over to our esteemed Bishop. Let's give her a hand, everyone, in the person of Reverend Dr. Jacqueline E. McCullough. God bless you, Bishop. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Minister Corey. I don't know if there's anyone else on your team. Excellent job, excellent job. And we don't have to worry one generation. The next generation and the youngsters being taught and we one of the questions that could be um, is Paul and James tells us in Ephesians, as you all read it, not of works, lest any man should boast. Faith without work. How do you bridge somebody who read those two scriptures and they said, wait a minute. Is it about faith? Is How do we put it together to show that Paul and James are not in conflict with each other? I throw the ball in your court. Sam, Sam you want to take that? That's a juicy one. I'm, I'm hopping. I'm hopping over here, but you're the teacher. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll pass the baton quickly after this. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I think what, what, what um, the conflict is, is that Paul is not talking about uh, works to do good. I think he's talking about um, salvation. You know, we, we can't bring any good thing from a moral or ethical standpoint to God saying why he should receive us. Um, because, Again, we, we, we should have been judged and should have been condemned and eternally separated from God. So Paul is, is addressing what we would bring as righteousness to God. James is, is bringing the result of God's work in us by faith to do good works. So, so James is, 
he's practical, but he's also taking in what is spiritual. You know, if, if God tells you to love somebody or to forgive somebody or to, to be kind to somebody, you're not doing it from your ethical standpoint or, or, or your moral standpoint. You're doing it from God's st standpoint of what is righteous, what is good, so that it doesn't reflect on how good you are. It reflects on how good God is. And that's, that's where I would leave it at. Oh, that, that, that's what... <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. That was wonderful. That was wonderful. Now, I'd like to add, I'd like to add. <laughs> I told you I'd pass the time. <laughs> that was absolutely excellent. Excellent response, Sam. I'd like to add just a footnote that Paul is dealing with a different kind of faith. And James is dealing with a different kind of faith. Both of them are, are actually arguing two different kinds of faith that are experienced by persons. So for example, when uh, James says that faith without works is dead, he is actually talking about and explaining um, the kind of faith that someone exercises when they believe that they're saved just based on the fact that they believe that God exists. That's a different kind of faith than the kind of faith that Paul argues for, which is the kind of faith that's actually a saving faith. So Paul, he believes in works too. But as Sim just so eloquently and clearly placed it, the works actually come after genuine faith that and and the works don't the works don't prove the faith per se. The works actually come out of a genuine relationship and a desire to please God. So in Pauline faith, as he's expressing it, a person that genuinely loves God, they're going to work because they really love God and they want to honor God and they want their works to actually show their honoring of God. Someone that James talks about, he's actually, he's, he's got the paddle out. He's got the paddle out and he's like spanking. And he's saying in his uh, letter that, that someone that says that they believe in God, they're just like a demon. And you know why? Because that person, they actually don't even live out and express and evidence the faith that they say they actually have. So the person actually says that they believe in God, but the person lives like a hellion, which is evidence. It evidences that the person only has an intellectual faith, but they don't have a saving faith. And that's the difference between the two. And many of us in, in, in church, we know people that just have an intellectual faith in God, they, they say, oh, I believe in God, but then they're sleeping around, they're cussing, they drink, they're doing all kinds of stuff. And they say, yeah, I know God is going to God is gonna save me. I know I'm going to be saved when I die. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to read the Bible. I don't have to do all of that stuff that you do. That's a James type of person that has faith. But the Pauline type of Christian that has faith is a person that gets saved they love the Lord and they say, I can't live like this no more. I got to do what pleases God. I don't care if I lose my family. I don't care if I lose my friends. I got to do what pleases the Lord. And they shut everything down just to honor God. That's a Pauline kind of Christian and a person that has faith, as opposed to a James kind of person who's not a, really a Christian, not really a Christian, but they have a intellectual faith, but it ain't genuine. Okay, um, and, and that note I also would like to point out is that James is not, is not endorsing that intellectual faith. He's actually saying if you have genuine faith, you will do works that reflect God. So, all right, so here I am now in your audience. I'm not a church person, you know, and somebody might be out there on social media. I really don't understand all of this language, but, but the bottom line is I'm getting it. I'm getting something. What am I getting? What am I getting? I'm getting that I come to God and I don't have the ability to, to, to save myself. So God pulls me to him. And I surrender my life to the Lord, but because he draws me to him, 
He calls me. I, I came. I, I don't even know why I came to the altar. I don't even know what happened, but I just felt. And then I surrendered my life. And I said, Ephesians 2, 8, I, I confess Romans 10, 9, and 10. I accepted him as my Lord. James said, hey, wait a minute. Okay. I was there when you got saved. I was there when you went up. So now in your everyday, in, in, in the butcher shop, in the shoe shine shop, in your business, in your office, because of your faith in God and God is living inside of you, you're going to do some things that are God-like. You're not going to you're not going to cheat people. You're not going to do the things you used to do because your faith works now. Your faith works for you. But there are people now that maybe may be saying that I love God, I know God, I believe in God, but but they live they don't have that transformation kind of experience or that ongoing sanctification. They are nominal Christians, we call them, but they're not convictional Christians. So so. All, all, all James and Paul are saying is we're together. We're not fighting. We're just saying the faith that drew you to God, the, the pulling that brought you to believe in the finished work of Calvary has the power to make you do things to please God and not please yourself. Am I right, gentlemen? Am I on the same team? Amen. Yes. Thank you for having me on your team. <laughs> Any one of you who would like to join in and make a comment, you can at this time. You can at this time. Uh, there's, there's, there's a question, gentlemen. It says, do nominal Christians go to heaven? <clears throat> you, you want us to answer that now? Yeah, yeah. Go, ahead. go ahead, Corey. Okay, so, so as not to confuse anybody, you think of you think of the seed being the word and people being believing that's the faith has been planted and it grows and it's, it becomes rooted. And the result of that, you see fruit. Um, and you'll know a person by their fruit. But will a nominal person be saved? Yes, they will be. But the question is, what rewards will they reap? And some would be of wood, some of hay, and some of stubble. Uh, so when you say nominal uh, Christian, it would be good to get a, an example of what you mean by nominal. Uh, okay. if, if that, that's, that's more of a question to, to answer. What do you mean when you use the term nominal so that we can answer the question appropriately? All right. And a, a nominal Christian is someone who ra was raised in the church. They know, by, they know Bible scripture or stories. Uh, they will tell you that they believe there's a God somewhere. Mm -hmm. Just like the demons believe in God. And, 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 they, and if they curse us, they'll say, oh, forgive me. They have a religious response to God. But they're not convictional. That means that they have never really accepted Jesus as Lord. Now, I believe a nominal, a nominal Christian could become a convictional Christian because we don't know who will or will not be. You understand what I'm saying? But that's what I mean by nominal Christian. So the answer to that question would be, well, you, you, I wouldn't call them a Christian. I would say they're a nominal churchgoer. Anytime you use the term Christian, that implies that their faith is in Jesus Christ. So they may have grown up in church, uh, but that makes them as much as a Christian as, as you are a car because you work in an auto mechanic shop. Uh, so even the term Christian and using that, that's the, a wrong term to describe them because to be a Christian is to be Christ-like and, and is to believe in who Jesus Christ and it's shown and is demonstrated by their fruit. So I would have to say, no, can you be a nominal believer? You know, is another uh, you know, type of question. Then what is a believer? So I don't think that anyone that says that they believe God, like it says, the demons believe in God also when they tremble. Many people believe God. In fact, the scripture talks about, did we not prophesy in your name and do all these in your name? And he'll say, depart from me, for I never knew you. Uh, so I wouldn't even say that they're a Christian. Uh, but for the sake of that answer, in what you're describing, the answer would be no. Uh, but I think a, a clear definition of what a nominal or a per individual. I think, I think, uh, Crystal Payne says in Webster's Dictionary, um, being something in name or form only. 
So that would be a no. There's no such thing as a nominal Christian. That's almost oxymoronic. Uh, it's an oxymoronic description of an individual who claims any faith. But uh, somebody who grew up in church, that's something totally different. Okay, okay. I, I really think this is so wonderful because that scripture, those two people, Paul and James, it has become a bone of contention for many churchgoers, even theologians. And for you to simply lay it out like this, you are really a cut above the average you know, Christian in reading and teaching this. And it's so clear because faith that got you to God and faith that's lived out when you're walking with God. So it's that, that's the simple thing. My faith got me to God. And who gave me the faith? God. And then that same faith working in me will cause me to do the works that pleases that please God. Okay? So that's simply what it is. So James and Paul, they're brothers in the faith. Amen? Praise the Lord. I thank you so much. I thank you. I thank you. I hope out there in, in um, social media that you do have understanding. And those of you who are watching, you'll be able to answer that question. Somebody's going to bring that subject up. So, and you can't say how many, how many, how many, you know, um, they, they're going to heaven and they both got the Holy Ghost. You can't say that. You're going to have to really explain it. Thank you so much, gentlemen. I really am very happy to know that... Um, that the younger, that the next generation is able to defend the faith, explain the faith, and that they're not just teaching it, they're also challenged by it. Amen. Whatever they taught tonight, they now have to walk in it and they do and they believe it. So thank you, Pastor Brian. You've done an excellent job. And you we always see the juice running and your mouth, your mouth getting water. Water, water in, drooling at the side of your mouth when something like this comes up. But we thank you so much. Anyone here has any questions or, or you would like any more explanation? Or you might want to make a comment about something that was made clear to you tonight before we, we, we leave. Anyone here? Yes. Good, good evening, Bishop and, and pastors and everyone. I um, really enjoyed the fact when you talked about how work was meant to be um, pleasing and, and, and joyful. That really, really caught my heart. You know, um, I, I can't say no more, but, you know, it really, really caught me that it is meant to be pleasing and joyful because of of who we are working for. Glory be to God. That that just really touched me right right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, we had someone from Facebook. Um, Brother Jonathan Washington wants to know, is there the born again experience, is there a transformation process? Is, um, is there a transformation process? Right. Um, He's saying the born again experience is that is there a transformation process in that? I suppose that's what he means. Um, I, I, I guess what, what I got from this teaching, especially where, where you get the comparison of Paul to James, again, is, is um, you know, James is um, Paul is talking about, you know, salvation and, and the works th that there's no works to 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 save you. James is talking about the, the faith that the saving faith that helps you to do good work. So whenever I think about that transformation that happens within us, you know, when we are, when we confess our sins and, and accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, there, there is an internal change in the sense that we no longer want to do the things we used to do in the old man. You know, we no longer, you know, even the very things that we were addicted to or, you know, the things that we couldn't help but do, we can't do it anymore. Like there's the, I think Bishop mentioned it, there's a conviction. You know, before if I, if I was a person to, to go get into a fight left and right and beat up somebody, and that was my vice, when I get saved, it's not so much that that desire is not in there. It's just so much that I'm, I'm saved that I no longer want to go there anymore to do that. Um, does that mean that I'm not gonna fall? No, because there, there are other areas where it, it, I'm not complete because we're, we're in this immortal body. We're in this corrupt, um, more, or corrupt moral, mortal body. But 
that's where sanctifi sanctification takes place. The, the, key, the key of that transformation is sanctification afterwards. Just because you're saved, again, doesn't just automatically stop what, what, was, what was done on Calvary. There's a continuation because of what was done on Calvary. We grow from faith to faith, from glory to glory. So that's what makes the, that's what makes the Christian faith so challenging. Just when we thought we overcome one thing, God says, no, here's another thing you have to overcome. Here's another thing I want to do in you. Here's another thing I want to change. And that's the continuing transformation from the, from the newness or that, that birth that we have when we're first saved. Amen. Thank you so and much. If I could just add yeah. something, Bishop, um, um, to, to, to um, further underscore uh, Sim's um, point, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 13 says, but we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and through belief in the truth. So, so sanctification is a process that begins once a person has been saved. And that sanctifying work, as Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica, is a work that is executed by the Holy Spirit um, until, of course, we are uh, glorified until we meet the Lord. So, so what, what's wonderful about the sanctifying process is the fact that it's riddled with ups and downs. It's riddled with moments of, of, of success and also moments of failure, whereby we actually learn how to actually um, surrender ourselves more to the Lord and arrest these physical passions so that we can do what's honorable to the Lord. So um, salvation uh, is spoken of differently in different parts in the scripture. It's, it's sometimes the author will use the word, we're saved which means sanctification. Sometimes they'll actually translate the word sanctification as being saved. So in, 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 in biblical terminology, salvation is something that's always happening to the believer. We're, we're always being saved. So when we move from that point where we're born again into the Christian life, we are constantly being saved from something and towards something else constantly so every single day we're being saved from cursing and we're being saved to a holy mouth every day we're being saved from fighting to a attitude of peaceableness every single day so every single day there is a salvation taking place and that's what sanctification means and implies every day is a saving from something and a saving towards something else. Thank you, Bishop. Okay, um, and I just, you know, terminology is so key um, that we need to, we just want you to get it, um, Brother Washington, just is so key. Born again means save or regeneration. It's the moment you, you surrender your life to the Lord that moment you are saved from the penalty of sin. Okay. But from that moment on, you need to be sanctified, separated, keep being separated from sin and, 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 and moved closer to the Lord. Okay. So born again means saved and sanctification means you're constantly being transformed by the renewing of your mind, by getting closer to God, by your, your thinking changing, taking on the likeness of Christ. All of those things after you're saved. It's like getting married. You have a big wedding and you walk down the aisle. That's just the ceremony and the, and the marriage or the wedding rather. After that, here comes a marriage. You have to live together. You have to pay the bill. You understand? You have to apologize. You have to rub feet, you know, all that stuff. All that stuff. The whole life changes. Your whole life changes. You're no more single. Now you're in a different kind of life. 
and it happens day by day. So I want you to know transformation comes because of the sanctification process. Being born again means you're in now. You have a relationship with the Lord. Your sin is forgiven. And thank you so much. And sometimes you think, well, you're saying it and Pastor Brian is saying it. We're saying it differently because people hear differently. Okay. And the more we say it, it's the more people understand, especially if this language is not being used in church continually. Okay. You hear people saying, I'm saved and sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, five baptized. But people don't know. And some people have never heard that. All right. We have to take the time. And I appreciate your time, gentlemen. I appreciate you taking time out for people like um, 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 Brother uh, Washington and anyone else who has those questions. We hope tonight that we have um, 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 answered your question. And thank you, Sister Hunter, for saying that we, but God commended his love toward us. She wants to know, can you explain that word commended? This is really good tonight. But God commended his love toward us. Can you explain what commendeth mean? Please, you all. Yeah. Somebody. I think uh, the word commend means like to commit or to entrust or give charge to something. Mm -hmm. So God has commended his love. Uh, he mentions it. He, he, he makes it acceptable or more acceptable. It's like it's, it's like a love that's, he committed his love to us. He's entrusted his love to us. Uh, so that's what it, uh, you know, you have to look at the biblical definition of a word. And, and as you were just stated a minute ago, Bishop, like understanding th these words and what they mean. Uh, and, and someone wrote demonstrates his love. Uh, and so this is what God is doing towards us and mm -hmm. for us. Uh, and so in, in that while we were yet sinners, Mm -hmm. right? uh, he committed himself, he demonstrated himself, he did this for us. Uh, and he entrusted us with that, like to give us salvation is to entrust us with the gift, uh, the gift of his love. So, and someone else was writing to show, to prove, to establish, to exhibit. Uh, so that's the definition of the word uh, commend, a biblical definition. And I'm trusting the sources uh, that are saying that. Uh, and so that's what God does for us and to us. Amen. Can I trust y'all on that one? Yeah, 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 yeah. If I could just add one little one little thing. Okay. Um. The 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 term the term in the Greek is sunestemi, and and what that what that means and implies, it means to actually to stand together with. So when the scripture says, but God commendeth his love towards us, what it's saying is that God is not only seeking to speak about commending love. He actually partners with that word. So when, when God says something, very interesting, when, when, we, look at, when we look at this um, 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 from, from a, from a a linguistic point of view. God, when God says something, he actually is what he says. He never says something that he does not intend to stand with and also to confirm. The scripture says in Isaiah 55, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall accomplish everything that I sent it forth to do, and it shall not return back to me void. So what does that imply? It implies that when God says a thing, it's going to happen. He's going to stand under and with his word. So when the scripture says that God commendeth his love towards us, it's saying that God is not just speaking words. He's actually going to back up what he's actually commending. He's going to stand with and stand under his word. So if he says that he loved us, then that love is not just a spoken love. It's a demonstrative love. It's a love that he is going to not only commit to, but he's going to show you how much he loves you. And he did that in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that. So when God loves, he not only loves in word, he loves too with something substantive. Yes, yeah, Sam? Um, I, that, I, I was going to mention because that, that's actually kind of why that's what prompted me to do that, that background of God is faithful, um, is uh, faithful and God is love. Because 
in chapter two of James, you see that James is cha challenging partiality and how he, he's talking about, you know, if you see somebody that's, that's not clothed and you do nothing, but you'd rather do um, more for somebody that's well-dressed and say, hey, sit here and give them good treatment. That's that partial love that we give. But, but when, when it's saying that, you know, just, just as the body is dead without the spirit, then also is faith dead without works, that, that goes to question what and who did the work? You know, who did the work for us to have this faith, to profess this faith, to even prompt us to do good works from this faith, and it's God. And, and you know, even in, in that text where it says com com commended love, God would be partial if he was conditional in when and how he loved you, because it says while you were yet in your sin. So God loved you while you were doing what you were doing, when you were doing it, and you loving when you were doing it. But he said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let this pass, but I'm going to show you that I still love you. And just like Pastor Brian says, how much I love you, that I'm even going to forgive you. I'm even going to reconcile you because he gave us that, also gave us the gift of reconciliation that he gave to us. What was this, Sandra Hunter? I hope you know that while you were where you were, doing what you were doing, he loved you. You understand? And he demonstrated it. So don't ever let the devil tell you anything else. You know that he shows his love. He's not going to say it if he doesn't mean it. I thank you so much. Now, we could be here all night long, but this is so wonderful. And I thank you all for just joining in. And, and we love this kind of discussion. But some people, they know it so much, it bores them. For me, it excites me because it means somebody else is learning it right. And because they're learning it right, they're going to live it right. I'm excited about that. Amen. And people are getting, people are not necessarily getting these kinds of answers in a lot of places, you know, so we just glad that you tune in and bring a friend the next time and ask your questions because we will stop and work with it. Amen. And if we don't know the answer, we'll go get it. And the next time we'll have it for you. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. Now, if, if you're excited about what happened here tonight, and I am, then you will give an offering. We just thank the Lord for Della Adams. We thank the Lord for Roslyn Watkins and Brenda Crane and Stephanie Kay and Mary Holland, Jonathan Washington, and of course, Sandra Hunter. We thank you. We thank you so much. And we want everyone to participate tonight and give us unto the Lord. And we thank you for hanging in there and asking your questions. May the Lord bless you and always give you an appetite for the word of God. For he said, he that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Let's give unto the Lord. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. No, not I, but the Christ that lives in me. And the life that I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loves me and gave his life for me. Who loves me? Who loves me? Who loves me and gave his life for me? And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loves me and gave his life for me. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, those of you in your participation, your support, and we pray your strength in the Lord. On behalf of Bishop Jacqueline E. McCullough and the Beth Rafa family, thank you for joining our live stream service. Visit us online at BethRafa.org where you can submit your prayer requests, give into the work of the ministry, and connect with our church family via social media. God bless you richly, and we look forward to you joining us again.